This morning, I have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Njema Fraser. She's the director of the Office of Experimental Sciences within NNSA. Dr. Fraser serves as a senior expert in experimental sciences and related research and development as applied to the behavior and reliability of nuclear weapons. She oversees a substantial portfolio that includes directing, planning, and coordinating programs in nuclear physics, hydrodynamics, plasma physics, material science, high energy density sciences, and ignition sciences. Dr. Fraser previously served as a physicist, acting deputy, and acting director for a number of NNSA um, scientific and technical programs, as well as a staff member of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Science. She's the co-founder of the DOE Professional Opportunities for Women at Energy Realized Employee Resource Group, a member of the National Advisory Board of the National Society of Black Engineers, and chair of the Algebra by Seventh Grade Initiative. She's trained as a theoretical nuclear physicist and holds master's and doctoral degrees from Michigan State University, as well as a bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fraser. Okay, good morning, everyone. I was just uh, notified of my time cards. I guarantee you we will not be uh, edging into an hour unless you have many questions. Um, so I am, um, as you heard, uh, Dr. Frazier, um, or Jama. Uh, my first name is a little tricky, so people usually just call me Dr. Frazier just to avoid the first name. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, uh, as was mentioned, I am the director of the Office of Experimental Sciences, which is a relatively new program um, in NNSA, kind of folded together uh, two other experimental science programs into a larger program. So. I'm going to start uh, talking from a little bit of the top down. Uh, so for the folks who have seen these type of presentations before, uh, feel free to sing along um, as we go through these. So with that, all right, here we go. Uh, so we have a timeline. So uh, NNSA was established in 2000, but we have been in the business of uh, fission and fusion for much longer than that. Uh, and I took the liberty on the Metro this morning of looking up some people that were born in 1942. All right. So uh, Stephen Hawking, born in 1942, Muhammad Ali, Paul McCartney, Aretha Franklin, Harrison Ford, Barbara Streisand, uh, John Witherspoon, <laughs> Carol King, Martin Scorsese, uh, Wayne Newton, Charlie Rose, Joy Beer, which I didn't know from The View, um, Frankie Lyman, which is kind of a sad one. Uh, and so I say that to say this. So if any of these people said, uh, I was born in 1942, uh, I decided that I was going to stop exercising in 1992. And I would like you to put me uh, as an emergency responder for the fire department, right? We would think they were crazy. You haven't exercised, have you even been to the doctor? How do we know we can, you can get up these stairs? How do we know you can carry this hose, right? You're of an age where I have uh, substantial questions about your ability to do this job. However, if you had said, yes, I go to the doctor regularly, he puts me through a battery of tests, I'm on the treadmill, I do lung capacity, I lift weights, um, I have been uh, certified by uh, fire, other firemen, right, and they can vouch for me and say that, you know, they're confident that I can perform this job, right? So I think sometimes when we talk about weapons, we don't really uh, give it the import that it needs, that we have this science basis that underpins everything we're doing now. So uh, other than NNSA being established, we decided in 1992, which I just alluded to, that we were going to stop doing underground tests. And we were going to maintain the stockpile using um, science-based stockpile stewardship. Uh, this is something that's been endorsed by each president since Bush, um, and something that we're going on with now and that our nuclear posture review uh, endorses. All right. So what do our weapons look like? So we have a, a lot of things going on here. Uh, the blue is the number of weapons in the stockpile. You'll see just an uh, a exponential rise in kind of the first 10 years from about, uh, there's a 10-year period where you go from about 
uh, 500 weapons to over 20,000 weapons. At our height, we are over 30,000 weapons. Um, you can see major events uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the um, fall of the Soviet Union, um, and then a number of our arms treaties that our arms treaties that contributed to the lessening of the number of warheads. Um, the red are weapons that are no longer in the stockpile. Uh, yellows are being phased out, uh, are um, extended through other means, and then green is kind of our future deterrent, right? So this kind of gives you a snapshot of where we are. Uh, this line that goes up and ends at, say, the number uh, 26 is the average age of the weapons in our stockpile, all right? So since we are not uh, creating new weapons and we are going with either reuse, refurbishment, replacement, just extending the life of the weapons we have uh, with the song, strong technical base that we have, um, these numbers are going up and will continue likely to go up. All right. So what is this a marriage of? This is a marriage of uh, the Department of Energy, specifically the National Nuclear Security Administration, and the Department of Defense with their carrier systems, right? So we have our triad of land, sea, um, and air for delivery of these weapons, and we have to make sure that that partnership is a strong one. Um, and you see here a combination of the uh, national labs and NNSA sites, and then the um, US delivery uh, platform sites <coughs> and Air Force bases and other bases throughout the country. Um, I spoke to the fact that this is a collaboration um, where the Department of Defense is setting those military requirements. Um, they are also um, responsible for the delivery systems. And then the Department of Energy is actually responsible for the warheads, uh, maintaining that strong s and base that I alluded to, um, and then managing our nuclear materials. So we have frequent interactions through the uh, National uh, Weapons Council and other means, um, and a number of different collaborations in which that keep us talking on a frequent basis, on a very regular basis. All right, so this is all of the cabinets, but these two are the ones we're interested in today. All right, so just to give you an idea of scale, um, grab this from OMB in terms of our FY20 budgets. Um, this is what we're looking at, and you're interested in defense and energy. Well, you might be interested in others, uh, but the, the ones I'm interested in, I should say, are Department of Energy specifically. Um, and you heard Bill talk to the fact that of that, say, 32 billion in DOE, about 16 of it is NNSA. So that's the executive branch. On the legislative branch, we have two authorization committees and two appropriations committees. Uh, the Hue and Sued, House Energy and Water and Synergy, Energy and Water Development are our appropriations committees. And then our HASC and SASC are our authorizers. And so um, we speak with them, obviously, uh, after the president's budget is rolled out, but then periodically to talk about um, our programs, our milestones, the impact we're having, um, and our level of confidence, and how we're working with the labs as partners. Um, also, how we're working with universities as partners, and how we are ensuring that we are sustainable through the um, academic alliances we have um, and our support of academia. Um, so our head honcho, is Rick Perry, which is, who is familiar to all of you, um, even before he took on this job, I'm sure. Uh, he is one of the first uh, confirmations that uh, took place in 2017 uh, after the administration switched over. And as you can see here, that he really places a uh, priority on uh, the nation's uh, security uh, posture and, and an NSA. All right, so these are FY19 numbers, but it just gives you an idea of the magnitude. Uh, that 15 is now 16, uh, but it gives you some proportionality between these missions and that of um, science, uh, energy, so energy efficiency and things like that, environmental management, and so forth. So this is kind of the makeup of, uh, of what comprises the Department of Energy. Below him is the NNSA Administrator and Undersecretary for Nuclear Security, Lisa Gordon Haggerty. Um, and uh, her second in command is who you just heard from. Uh, so he is 
really placing a priority on this, as is she. Um, and she has a really strong commitment, I will say, to the attraction, um, recruitment, and retaining uh, retention of uh, the minds and bodies uh, that have the scientific knowledge uh, and the scientific wherewithal. So she really places a strong emphasis on us having um, a strong pipeline for stockpile stewardship and sees that as one of her major uh, initiatives. Uh, her budget, if we break this down, we have weapons activities, nuclear nonproliferation, naval reactors, um, and then federal salaries and expenses. Um, so, so, that's a, so that's the breakdown there, and you can see the preponderance of it is in weapons activities, um, and that number is obviously slightly higher, I believe, in FY20, and it's being discussed now um, by Congress. So we have some of the marks, uh, but we're about halfway through that process, um, and then there'll be some wheeling and dealing, and then we'll figure out what we have um, before FY20 starts uh, October 1st. So these are the three prongs that uh, Bill spoke to, naval reactors, threat reduction, and uh, what we're interested in here, uh, the weapon stockpile. And you can see that cutting across all three of those are your science, technology, and engineering, people and infrastructure, and then management and operations. And so we really try to make sure that we are not um, stovepipe. We do a lot of work across 10, 20, and a NA10, NA20, and NA80, which are these respective uh, organizations, um, and we try to make sure that we are leveraging the resources we have. So uh, leveraging the uh, facilities we have, the high-performance computing, um, the expertise for things, you know, um, so you use nuclear in a certain respect in 10, you may be interested in nuclear forensics for 20, and things like that. And so uh, things like attribution and things come in handy, but they're all kind of those scientific tools applied to various uh, challenge problems we have. And then underneath, uh, Lisa Gordon Haggerty is her. Direct report is Charlie Burden, uh, who's kind of our, oh, he was our newest confirmed person uh, before Bill. Uh, so he came on board uh, in October. He was sworn in October of last year. Uh, and because he has so much experience in the complex, he has really come in and been able to take charge of the DADP uh, position and really has us marching towards uh, reconstituting capabilities in production and maintaining that strong science base and making sure that we are um, being vigilant in those scientific areas. Um, and I think that he uh, would probably appreciate that analogy of um, not having gone to the doctor and appreciating the age of um, weapons in a stockpile that's about to become an octogenarian. Uh, so another thing that has us marching forward is the uh, February 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. Um, a lot of work in 2019 um, and 2020 budget preparation was really about this responsive and resilient enterprise, right? Being, having maximum flexibility and being able to make decisions as situations change. Um, so that's a little different from previous nuclear posture reviews, um, the one in, I believe, 1994 and 2010, um, had less of that in there. So these are things that are really going to take active management and um, oversight to make sure that we are um, aligning ourselves to this kind of expanded role um, as we look at our scientific tools and capabilities uh, within the complex. All right, so uh, when Charlie came in, he really keyed in on responsive and resilient. And so we asked him, you know, what does this mean for you? Uh, and this is a little bit of, of what he said when he expanded on what he meant by responsive, just being able to uh, respond quickly as things change, as I mentioned before, and then resilient, just snapping back into place, right? So getting back into form quickly uh, when there's been some sort of a situation or insult or, or what have you. So as scientists, I think we can appreciate these uh, phrases and, and what they mean for the complex, but it's not something that is going to come automatically and it really takes um, kind of attention to that, uh, that tenant or those tenants. All right, so a big part of having a responsive uh, posture is having a responsive uh, enterprise. 
So this is our, uh, these are our sites across the nation, um, and a lot of these are pretty old. Uh, so something else that was emphasized in 2018 is really uh, infrastructure modernization, making sure that we have the facilities uh, that we need to act on um, these directives that we've been giving in recent years. So there's been a lot of attention paid to, to um, what we're going to need to um, uh, restore, revamp, if we need to consolidate various facilities for operational efficiency, um, if we need to build uh, new um, buildings for those that are in excess of 40, 50, 60 years old, you know, where does that come into the planning? Um, so that's a lot of what we're looking at now. So just the enabling um, infrastructure is a key part of uh, where we're going with the responsive enterprise as well. Um, a little bit about the uh, sites in ST&E that we deal with uh, quite a bit, as you guys know, and uh, you'll be exposed to those on a more frequent basis uh, through SSGS, uh, SSGF and LRGF. And Nevada especially is one that has a very uh, rich history. They all have a rich history, and I, I think that, you know, um, this is the Nevada National Security Site, um, but we, I think one of the first things I heard about and then say our DOE or, um, was the fact that, you know, the, the Nevada test site, right? Before you even hear um, about the laboratories and what they're doing. So I think that all of these are key. Uh, what I don't interact with as much, but we do in defense program, are the plants. And so that's, those production agencies are, you know, are a heavy part of what we need for our strategic materials and our nuclear weapons uh, missions in terms of uh, PITs and CSAs. And so they're really an important part of uh, this equation. So between the labs and the plants, um, this is what we have at our, at our disposal in terms of building our arsenal. All right, so I mentioned that st &E was cross-cutting. Um, I would say that as we look at it, there are a few different cuts that you can take of this, um, but the one that's most commonly taken is really just saying, um, ensuring the confidence, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the currently deployed stockpile, um, carrying out life extensions, and MOD here is uh, mods, modernizations, um, as required, and then looking to the future, right, and implementing the uh, deterrent options uh, that are needed or as directed. So a little bit of that direction uh, was given, or a lot of that direction was given in the NPR, um, and then situations are changing, you know, um, almost daily, right, to which we have to make sure that we are still aligned to what we need to do for the country. So if you take the first pillar of nuclear weapons and the cross-cutting areas, uh, this basically uh, says that you still have st &E people, equipment and infrastructure, and uh, management and operations, but you're looking now within that subsection and then maintaining the current stockpile, life extensions, and then preparing for the future. So this is really how we, you know, um, structurally how we look at um, our ability to meet the deterrent needs and how we break that down. Uh, so the person in charge of that is Dr. Kathleen Alexander. Um, unfortunately, Kathy will be retiring at the beginning of July, and so we'll have a uh, new leadership reporting to uh, Charlie Verdon um, as soon as we may hear next week, but it'll have to be in place uh, after July 6th. So, uh, you know, I just want to say, uh, Kathy has been a great leader. She's, uh, she is an alum of Los Alamos as well as Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, material scientist, just um, one of the most capable people within the complex I've had the opportunity to meet, um, and we will miss her. But she actually set in place a lot of things during her five years as ADA uh, for research, development, test, and evaluation. So we will be marching forward with that, right? All right, so one thing um, when I thought about what would be important to impart to you guys as uh, graduate students, um, other than the fact that, you know, this is an excellent program and you guys are really at the nexus of 
science, security, and policy, which is an exciting thing. It's actually the thing that you know brought me to Washington, D.C. after grad school, right, working on the Hill. Uh, at the time, I thought that you know you couldn't have too many scientists. I still think that, but uh, the the way I thought about it when I first got to D.C. was a lot different from the way I think about it now. When I first got to D.C., uh, I thought that if you just knew more about what I was doing, you'd give me more money, <laughs> right? If you just knew more, so if I just talk longer, right, <laughs> you'll give me more money. So, um, <laughs> so 20 years later, I think about it a little bit differently. Um, and I think of it in terms of audiences and knowing your audience and making sure that you are providing, you know, um, what your uh, customer or partner values or saying it in a way that really turns on a light for them. Um, and I, that's a preface to say that, you know, we're supporting science, but we're supporting it for weapons activities, right? So that's how we're a little bit different from, say, what NSF would do or NIH would do. You know, everybody's doing it to their mission. Um, and our mission is the weapons activities that we have within NNSA. So um, the way I've broken it down here is enduring stockpile. This will all start to look familiar. Um, making sure that we have those capabilities. Um, life extension and responsiveness uh, is another pillar. And again, responsiveness is one of those key words uh, that came out of 2018 um, and that we've been giving a lot of uh, attention to in recent years. Uh, knowledge base and infrastructure, uh, look to your left and to your right. Uh, making sure that we have that intellectual capital for the country. And then finally, those broader national security missions, um, and I spoke to that a little bit earlier, but that's something where we want to make sure that we are using um, our tools to the best advantage, the greatest advantage uh, for our nation. All right, so what does the budget picture look like once you drill down? I talked a little bit about the $30 billion level, 15 to $16 billion level, and now we're down to the $2 billion level. Um, for RDT and E, uh, what I've circled here is kind of the total, um, but it's comprised of, uh, in congressional speak, uh, inertial confinement fusion program. Um, I can't see those from here, but we'll just say advanced simulation and computing, looks like it's next. Uh, science campaigns, engineering, and then advanced manufacturing. Um, and so those are our numbers for 20. As I said, those are going through Congress right now. Um, so we will see uh, how we fare. Um, having that mission at the end of it has really um, been something that's uh, been an advantage for us um, with respect to uh, the stability of our numbers. I think people really appreciate the fact that we have to have that continuity and we have to be able to say that we have an enduring program uh, in these areas. All right, so about half of that two billion is uh, inertial confinement fusion and science, and those are the programs that I mentioned earlier have recently been rolled into um, one experimental science program. Uh, and what that's allowing us to do is really make sure that we are um, aligning our resources, aligning our people, aligning our goals, our priorities, our milestones, et cetera, um, across those two programs. And then we work across that bridge with advanced simulation and computing, making sure that we have the um, models and that uh, we are giving the validation data that they need over an ASC. Uh, it's been about eight years there. Um, that's led now by Mark Anderson, who's doing a fantastic job. Um, and then working with engineering, which is um, a little bit broader um, than what one might think in terms of just, say, non-nuclear components. This is a lot of the uh, technology maturation. Uh, what we're calling the um, Stockpile Responsive Program is in engineering. Um, we actually uh, have more uh, connections in engineering with um, the people who do directed <laughs> stockpile work and life extension work. So there's a lot actually tied up in engineering. And then the advanced manufacturing is where you're going to have um, a number of additive things and just different ways uh, to uh, be proactive in how we do manufacturing. So that's what comprises RDT&E. 
Um, and again, you'll see a lot of mission-based um, points here with respect to why we're doing the science, right? So it's tied to the warhead, it's tied to current and future stockpile, it's tied to future design uh, options. So a lot of this, there's different uh, ways to look at our currency, right? A lot of it, uh, some of it is cost savings, um, but then you also have uh, risk avoidance. You have opening up the design space for different options that you can have. So science just brings a lot to the table um, across different axes. Um, the chart you're seeing on the right kind of shows um, that a lot of this, uh, a lot of the budget has to do with operations, right? So it costs a lot to operate NIF and it costs a lot to build ECSE, right? So it's not fully just a um, billion dollars for R&D, everybody have fun. So, um, so there are things that happen within there, but we try to support the breadth of science uh, that were needed at a very significant level. Uh, we try to make sure that the facilities we have and the resources and tools we have are aligned to what that R&D mission, which is aligned to what that deterrence mission is. So it all ties together. All right, so this is a little bit of what I said. Um, when you think about a nuclear weapon, you're going through um, uh, many degrees of order in time and temperature and space and all of those type of things, right? So if you do modeling and simulation, you're aware of you know, how complex that can be, especially if you're doing experiments. Uh, you know that you are exploring different regimes with light sources than you are with you know, sometimes uh, HED or shock uh, experiments at DAC and things like that. So um, it really takes a, uh, a suite of experimental tools to take us through all the regimes that we need to explore uh, for this weapons physics problem. So this is just, it would get too small if I tried to put everybody in here. So these are just some examples um, of some of the facilities that we have and why we need them and how they can be complementary to one another. Um, so, you know, obviously you, everybody can look up here and say, okay, where's Lance or where's, you know, um, Omega or where is this? But, you know, so we really have, um, what we pride ourselves with is a, a real suite of experimental facilities that can help us access um, the regimes um, to the degree possible through science and technology um, for the nuclear weapons complex. So um, now that I've kind of sold the uh, science and the facilities, uh, this is where I say that, you know, without you guys, without um, programs that are academic alliances getting um, the top talent into the complex, um, this would, you know, kind of wither rather quickly, right? So, you know, uh, we see bathtub charts back at headquarters all the time about, you know, all the people that are approaching retirement age or people who have been wooed away uh, by industry and things like that. And so, you know, it's really uh, important for us to make sure that you understand um, how much uh, we value uh, you guys participating in this program and you guys uh, coming to events like this, um, interacting with people at the labs, uh, asking us questions about you know, what it means to be um, uh, an MO contractor or a Fed, so whatever role you know, you're entertaining, uh, whether it's in the complex or if it's just you know, uh, an ally, then, then that's something that's really something we uh, wanna make sure that we're getting all those answers to you. Um, and answering those questions. So you'll hear more about SSAA and um, NLUF and things like that, and I'm sure a number of you are, are really familiar with these. We do do them uh, jointly, a uh, number of them jointly with the Office of Science, um, and we also do things uh, with NSF as well. So uh, we're looking at how we um, broaden what we consider our suite of available resources right now across these programs. All right, so why SSAP is critical. So I mentioned some of this, but really it's to do with the um, training, it's to do with the uh, exposure to the laboratories and understanding how they work, understanding our mission and understanding the science and understanding the policy, right? So, you know, making that kind of juggernaut of a uh, scientist or engineer uh, is really something that we value uh, with NNSA. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we are uh, 
providing those opportunities so that we can, you know, develop the people we need um, that can use the tools we currently have uh, to meet our really grand challenge problems. Um, if you look at the next generation of stewards, um, they're supported by other agencies as, as well as NNSA. Um, we like to think that we are, you know, um, providing something that's a little different um, from the other agencies, but we understand that, you know, working in concert, we're really uh, putting our resources to the best use. And then we are creating hopefully superior candidates uh, for people who are considering coming to the labs. All right. So uh, yes, you are able to publish. So, so that's a good thing. Uh, these are questions we get. Uh, no, you probably won't be able to take your cell phone back, but you can take breaks and go see yourself. Um, yes, there will be firewalls. So I'm trying to think of all these questions you get uh, with the NNSA complex. But you know the problems that you're looking at, right? Basically, you know the creation of you know um, things with millions of degrees of freedom, right? And um, understanding how those things work are just um, amazing problems to be able to work on. All right, um, so our research is uh, supporting research and the researchers. These are just a number of our centers of excellence from our last call. Uh, we have those both in um, across ICF and science, and they're also centers of excellence in the uh, ASC program, as you can see here. So those are the PSAP ones. All right, and then we have our academic fellowship. So it's really, you know, uh, kind of a, a menu of things that we're hoping uh, help us get um, people at various stages with various interests. Um, also br building in kind of, you know, um, the collaboration that comes along with the centers um, and the individual work that we're able to do with, you know, grants and fellowships and so forth. So it's, it's a compendium of things. All right, looking across the country. Um, is Terry in the room? Okay, I'm hoping Millie or Terry are not in the room because they gave me a very nice chart and I kind of massacred it so that you guys could see the facilities. <laughs> so I kept the map part, but then I just enlarged some of these universities. Uh, but the idea is um, just to kind of see the impact that we have nationwide. And people really like this slide um, back at headquarters at NNSA. Uh, people like it on the Hill. Um, and if you've had interaction with the Hill, you understand that that's because, you know, it's a constituent game, right? And people, you know, if you meet them where they're at with supporting the people uh, within their districts, um, either directly or, you know, in kind of a uh, one-off or ancillary way, uh, that's something that really gets conversations started. So it's a very valuable um, piece of what we use to demonstrate our value um, as a program. So. There's the uh, Laboratory Residency Graduate uh, Fellowship, 2018, started in 2018. There goes uh, SSGF, I think 2006. So, you know, you have a number of different programs uh, that date all the way back to 2002. So, you know, we have some pretty good uh, data and reasons for having confidence in the success of these type of programs throughout. Uh, if we switch to the ASC side, um, we have CSGF and the Predictive Science Academic Alliance program, uh, also hitting a number of uh, states throughout the nation. Um, and that program has been in place for, I'll say, over a decade as well. I don't know when the first year was, but I know that it uh, goes at least as far back as 2005, maybe earlier. Because um, I was in the program when we did that. Uh, so yes, and Hawaii, so we hit Hawaii. So not just contiguous U.S. All right, so um, we don't have a sign up. How much time do I have? Okay, oh, okay, it's fine. Actually more than, more than that, sorry, about 13. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were gonna say a big difference between eight and, okay. All right, so, um, so we've covered a few things. So we've covered um, kind of why we're here, the mission basis, um, what the components of our program are, um, and why it's important to kind of speak stockpile. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges um, going forward and why you guys are key to addressing these. All right. 
So we start from a place where we value science, right? We start from a place where we understand that without science, um, we are going to be in a much more difficult situation. We need science to understand the safety and performance of our current weapons, right? So nobody gives any argument there. Then you build on that and you say, not only do we need it to understand our current stockpile, we need it to understand the impact of any changes we're considering, right? Whether they be due to age, configuration, um, requirements from DOD, you name it, right? We need to understand what the impacts of those changes are going to be. And science is a key building block for that. And you don't get any argument there. Where you start to get argument, uh, is when you talk about the fact that you're going to need to do things in a different way, right? You may not be able to do it the way uh, you did it in 1992 or 1972 or 1952, right? You needed to do it in a way where you understand that by 2025, we are not going to have any designers left uh, that did things in a traditional way. Uh, you need to really make a better use of your computational power, right, which was part of why um, ASCII was created in the first way, the, uh, first place to get ahead of that curve um, for ramping up the number of teraflops uh, we're able to have and why we're currently, you know, pursuing exascale, right? So just that understanding needs to be there. Um, theorists, the ability to exercise the people within your complex, the ability to take traditional um, uh, fields of study, nuclear, and kind of um, have a curriculum um, either in school, after school, through these programs, or once you get into the laboratory to really understand the uh, extent to which uh, those fields and how those fields apply to the science that we're exploring in nuclear weapons. So uh, these are kind of the things that, that we know and that are challenging to us. And we also have some new direction, as I mentioned, in the NPR, right? So um, these are a few quotes from the NPR that uh, kind of give a nod to the fact that we have to make sure that we have the experimental program that we need uh, for it the, and the um, uh, modeling and simulation you know, infrastructure and capabilities that we need for that. So this is something, you know, when you look at technological surprise, when you look at the change of the makeup uh, of the constituency, you know, you have to say, okay, so there are some complexities and layers to just saying, you know, not only do I support the science, but to what extent do I support the science and where does the science need to go? All right. And then people start to say, okay, so I like the science. Uh, I agree with the NPR. I appreciate the fact that you're losing designers, but why does that mean you need $2 billion? Why does it mean you need $2.5 billion, right? And so these are the kind of questions where, you know, minds like yours uh, with the experience that you have and are going to have are really going to help us, you know, kind of answer those things, right? So speaking in a way where you're not just talking about the work you're doing for, say, uh, nuclear astrophysics, right? But you're able to talk about it in a context um, that helps us build that argument beyond um, anecdotal to really a, um, a paradigm that supports um, the level of science that we're going to need for kind of a more responsive and agile uh, complex. All right. And we also have to see where do we see science, right? So, you know, depending who you ask, you, it could be at any one of these levels, right? You could see science as a driver, deliverable, a requirement, that's kind of where I fall, uh, capability, that's kind of where some other people fall, and then or as a tool, right? And these are all important aspects of, you know, um, of a system. And they're all needed, they build on one another. But we have to figure out, you know, as a community, where we see science. And then, you know, if we want to say that science is a requirement, how do we defend it? Okay. And that means having some real quantitative ways that we can express the value of science um, to, in this case, the complex. And I actually see this as something that's probably going to be um, more important across the various agencies in the federal government um, and in the private sector, I'm sure. So I'm probably, there's probably no place in which, you know, these kind of, uh, these kind of requirements for uh, justifications, quantification, uh, demonstration of value um, are going to be exempt. All right. 
So something that we're doing uh, in uh, research, development, test, and evaluation uh, is recasting um, what we called previously our predictive capability framework. And this gets, this kind of underscores the point I was making earlier. <laughs> the previous version of this talked about how do we get to predictive scientific capability, right? Which is something that appeals to me and probably appeals to people in the room, but is not something that appealed to people so much outside of the room or on the hill, right? Because it was always something that you were just like, that's very nice, right? But we have other things that we consider requirements and we consider you a capability. So you saw my hierarchy chart there, right? So we are recasting that, um, and this is a, a draft version of the slides. Uh, Kathy's probably gonna sign out the charter um, for the council before she leaves, so that's happening in the next week. But how do we communicate that value of science to people who are really trying to say, okay, how does this relate? How do I draw a straight line from what you're doing, <laughs> right? to what's happening uh, in our deterrence picture and what we need for sustaining the stockpile, for um, what are these? looking at the future deterrent, for threats, and for modern materials. So we try to be a little bit you know, uh, proactive in getting in front of that internally so that we can couch things in the way that you know, our audience is receptive to. I don't think I have too much more. Another way to look at that is to say, you know, we talked about the current stockpile, we talked about life extension, we talked about future options, right? So how do the capabilities that we have within there, the scientific capabilities, fit within that structure and how do they build on each other? So if I could have made a vertical, you know, kind of ice cap type of thing I could have, but my PowerPoint abilities failed me. Right. And so I'll end here in that, you know, um, what the biggest challenge, all right, cool, I'm on the green slide. Um, the biggest challenge right now is making sure that we build a robust requirements case um, for the science that we're doing, for how we've chosen to um, diversify our portfolio, how we're looking at different areas, um, why we are never gonna be willing to give up, you know, um, academic alliances and programs like SSGF and LRGF and why they're critical. Um, and then why investment in facilities is critical. So there are a lot of different pieces to this, um, but it's all gotta be part of, you know, um, saying that for the nation, you know, science is a requirement and something that we've not only needed since 1942, we will need uh, into the foreseeable future, so. All right, with that, thank you. Appreciate it.